Hello and welcome to the DIY Investing YouTube channel. We're working through every company in the S&P 500 and today is Danaher Corporation, ticker DHR. Over the next few minutes, I'll discuss my thoughts on both the valuation of this company and its business quality. First up, we have a market cap of $193 billion, enterprise value of $209 billion. We can see that there's about a $16 billion gap there due to some debt leverage on this business. So they're going to be boosting up their return on equity with some of that debt. They're operating in the healthcare equipment and supplies industry. They design, manufacture in this business description and market professional, medical, industrial, and commercial products. So that doesn't tell me much. Three segments, life sciences, diagnostic, environmental. Life science is mass spectrometers, flow cytometry, genomics, various different pieces of equipment. Diagnostics provides chemistry, amino assay. It looks like testing systems. Environmental is instrumentation, consumable software services. So Looks like they are very well diversified, but basically operating healthcare equipment. That should be a pretty good industry. It would depend on the individual product, but you'd expect high margins. You'd expect a moat, and we will see if that plays out into the numbers. Now, one of the caveats of a good um, industry and a good business is 20 straight years of profits or at most one year of loss in the last 20 years. And Danaher has that. So they have 20 straight years of profits here from 2002 to 2021. They have been profitable every single year. Now you do see some cyclicality in this business as it goes up and peaks in 2006, comes down to a bottom in 2009, goes up again. But then it's interesting, although the, I wouldn't even call this so much as a cycle since 2010, but kind of a steady decline in the business. And that's a little discouraging. I don't like to see that where it looks like the business just is getting worse and worse over time. Because you started at 2010 with a return on vested capital of 11%, and then you get down to 6% in 2020. Back up at 9% in 2021, but overall a downward trend over the last decade or so, which is a little discouraging, not something I'm super interested in. But the fact that they've been profitable the whole time is a very good sign. Now, when would I be open to a decline like this? If they never dropped below this 10% line, that would be a lot better because it would mean that they're continuing to sustain returns on capital above the 10% line. 10% return on invested capital is really the threshold I like to meet for my investments, 15% on return on equity. And when we see a 10-year median returns here, they're just a little bit below that. 8.4% return on invested capital, 11% return on equity. And again, I want this number at 15, this number at 10. If you hit that, then that allows you to earn 10 to 15% returns on your investments. On top of the fact that they've had a declining business over the last 10 years, they have a PE of 30, which is very, very expensive. So what's happening here, it looks like, is that you're paying up for high quality business that just can't sustain very high returns. It's probably just because the revenue growth is at 6% and you're growing EPS at double digits. But I have my concerns about the long-term vi long viability of that. So we need to see what they're doing with their cash flow to really justify this. Um, let's see here. Revenue start at 18 billion, go to 29 billion. So they grew about 50% over the course of the decade. EPS is up 10%. Let's see how that plays out. So yeah, you can see that they've more than doubled over the last decade at $3.36 earnings per share up to $8.61. They have paid a dividend, but it's been relatively small. If you look at this, dividend is about like 3% of earnings. Their current payout ratio is about 10% of earnings. So it's still relatively small payout ratio. So you are getting a dividend, but it's only a small percentage of what you're getting off this EPS. So the EPS is growth is really going to track what your return is. And that's looking like a 10% compounded rate. Not bad, and it's something you can probably sustain quite for some time as long as the return on equity stays in the double-digit range like this. This is just a very borderline result. There's nothing here that I'm super excited about. Um, I'm not excited about the median returns. It appears that the valuation is quite overvalued, so it says 30. See if that's accurate. It looks about right, 266 over $8.61. So this company is definitely at too high of a price. I would not pay this price. I like to buy stocks at 15 or less on the PE side, and this company is just simply too expensive. In addition, the earnings aren't growing fast enough to justify it because if you grow at 10% a year, then maybe you're going to double every seven years. So it means it would take seven years without any movement in price to get your PE down to 15 and that's a little steep. Basically, you're going to be at a whole decade to get down your PE to 10, which is when you really start earning that 10% yield on your cost. And so I don't like to wait 10 years to earn my 10% yield on cost. So it's just a little high on the price side. And I'd say the quality is certainly above average, but I'm not sure it's high quality because the return on vested capitals aren't higher than 10%. 
If you're enjoying this video so far, please hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe. Your subscriptions help to grow the channel, tell YouTube you're enjoying this content. So does your like button. So if you're enjoying my content, please like every video you see here. I'm uploading videos Monday, Wednesday, Friday, each and every week, working through the whole S&P 500. And at the end of the video, I'll have a link to the playlist where I've already covered 120 plus S&P 500 companies. So let's go to the income statement. You can see this big gap between revenue and cost of goods sold that's been sustained quite for some time. So that it looks like a pretty stable, large number. And so they're really earning a lot off this extra revenue. Now, there's a huge jump from 2020 to 2021. Actually, huge jump from 2019 to 2020 and from 2020 to 2021. It looks like they've been a major beneficiary of COVID. And that's even more scary because it means that you've really not grown a lot. Look at this. So from 2012 to 2019, you were basically flat. The business wasn't growing. This is really interesting. You didn't grow the business for seven, eight years. Gross profit didn't grow for eight years. And yet in COVID, you've basically doubled your gross profit. That should be very, very concerning as an investor because what that's telling you is that you're dependent upon the higher usage of COVID, of testing, of healthcare equipment and supplies in order to justify the valuation and you're paying 30 times earnings on this top end, this is a setup for a very, very poor future return. You've also diluted about, what's that, 5%, you know, 3 to 5% over the course of the decade. That's not significant, um, but there has been some dilution. Balance sheet. What do we see here? There's a lot of goodwill. You can see that they've basically made over $25 billion in acquisitions over the course of the decade. And again, that they're not growing there. Although it looks like some of those acquisitions did occur in 2020 and 2021. So that's part of where your growth is. It's not completely COVID. There might have been acquisitions in there. Long term debt is up 4x from 5 billion to 22 billion. So you've gone up 4x on your long term debt, but you've only doubled your earnings. That's not a good sign. Let's go to cash flow statement. So pretty steady acquisition spending all the time. I don't know why it doesn't show up as well, but $30 billion in acquisitions over the last two years, a significant amount of money being spent there. I mean, if you think about the fact a $20 billion acquisition is a whole decade's worth of net income. Um, it's less now, now that you're ramping up, but I mean, are these numbers sustainable in a post-COVID world? I don't know. I mean, it's really hard to tell from the numbers we're seeing here. You need to do a longer um, section of the business. Also, you have this stock-based compensation that's causing that dilution over time. It's not terribly high, um, but without steady buybacks to offset that, you are being diluted. So your returns are just going to be a little worse than the business overall. To me, this is an above average company, but it's trading at a substantially high price. So it's interesting, but it's not going to go on my watch list because there's a few red flags to me. I don't like the fact that you had seven straight years without revenue growth. Um, that's really a major concern. And you did have some declines here from 23 to 2014. Maybe there was, um, let's go back to the balance sheet. It's not like there's a big spinoff showing up here, but maybe they had a spinoff. Um, if they had a spinoff, that could have explained some of it because you did drop down to 20 in 2014 and then you grew from there. That's a little bit of forgiving, but then you had acquisitions for growth. Without the acquisitions, you weren't growing. I just have a lot of concerns here that you're not set up well in terms of long-term profitability. I think this revenue growth caker is overstated. I think your EPS, organic EPS growth is overstated. And so to get single digit growth for a PE of 30, is just not appetizing to me. So to me, the price needs to be cut in half. Something at 130, 140, the company starts to become interesting because they are reinvesting a lot of capital and they're still getting decent returns on that capital. So it could be interesting at half the price it is today, again, 130 range. But for me, it's it's not worth even waiting on it because I've seen a lot better companies. So I'm gonna pass on Danaher. It's not gonna go on my watch list, but I think it could be interesting for those interested in adding something like a healthcare equipment company, but certainly not these prices. They're simply too high. If you enjoyed this video, please hit that like button. I really need your likes. Let YouTube know you're enjoying my content. Don't forget to subscribe. Ring the bell so you can get notified when I upload new videos. If you like the way that I'm presenting this content, if you like this software that I'm using, this software is QuickFS. QuickFS.net, you can get a link 
with my affiliate link is in the description below. First link in the show notes there. And if you click that link, you can go to this website, sign up for either a free or a paid account. And if you do, and you eventually become a paid account, then I get a commission for sending you to them. This is the content I use myself. I don't promote anything I don't use myself for my own analysis, but I find it very helpful for looking at stuff. In five to 10 minutes, I can get a read on a company because it's very simple and presented to me with quickfs.net. So thank you for listening. And until next time, stop paying fees, start building wealth.